Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. Okay, on the show today, Nick Winkleman. So Nick is the Head of Athletic Performance and Science at the Irish Rugby Football Union. He is a top boy when it comes to coaching. Uh, he's your man for queuing, for metaphors, just sports science up the wazoo. Started his life in American football, I think, Nick. Is that right? You got it. Yeah, absolutely. Sure, don't be fooled by the accent. Joining us from <laughs> Dublin today, Nick, welcome. Mark, it's a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on. So, first of all, f- thanks and respect to our mutual friend, Rafe Kelly, who uh, put me on to you and, you know, he ran the Movement Summit where you were there and I thought, you know what, I want to chat to this guy myself. So, um, shout out to Rafe. And, uh, yeah, so how did you get interested in the body, Nick? What was your route into it? You know, for me, interestingly enough, I was in, I was in high school and, you know, playing sports like everyone was, but I wouldn't say, Mark, that I had a a real passion for them. I did them because that's what everyone does. My dad's like, hey, you got to get in a couple things. But I met this guy named Rudy. And for anyone who knows pop culture stateside from the 90s, uh, Rudy was a famous movie about a walk-on at Notre Dame from an American football perspective. And so it's this, it's this celebrated story. And the strength coach I had in high school was the exact same way. He was this, this, this character that was larger than life. And so every day he rocked up and whatever it was, 2.30, the bell would ring. He'd open the gym and you'd walk in there. And it literally was the same meat and potatoes program on the wall, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. But Mark, this, this guy invested in people. Like you knew when you were walking in there, you weren't just getting instruction on how to move better. You were getting instruction on how to live better. And, you know, for four years straight, I would sit there and I'd watch students come back in year after year who maybe had left 10 years ago and they were continuing to come to learn from this person. And so for me, he was probably the first person that helped me fall in love with movement as a practice, Mm -hmm. independent of a sport, but funny enough, bring this kind of mental state to your physical state and show how they work together. And so credit's got to go to Rudy. And was that when you decided you wanted to coach or did that come later? Like when was that decision? Th- that was very much so in parallel. I, I would say my, my junior or senior year in high school, I kind of went through a bit of a body transformation. You know, I was in my eyes, in my eyes, I was overweight. I didn't feel that the size I was, so to speak, being asked to carry from an American football really jived with me. And so I leaned way down. I lost like 60 pounds over the course of six months. And Rudy, again, was influential in this. And so it was at that point that I finally had seen myself on the outside, the way I had always felt on the inside. And to some, that might sound superficial. But for me, there was something deep about this practice and making this change. It was far more than just the scale. And when I look back, there was, there was Rudy, there was a nutritionist, there was my grandfather, there was my parents, my teammates. All these people had invested in me. And it was at that moment, the finish of that transition, I knew I wanted to dedicate the rest of my life helping other people go through similar transformation. And it just so happened, it was through the vehicle of movement that I chose to enter into servitude. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice. I like how you say servitude. That's, uh, that's good. That's very much how I consider any, any good coaches in acting in service in that way. And... <sighs> It's interesting. Most of our listeners are kind of, we could say, from the alternative world, yoga, dance. And sometimes people in that world are sort of looking down a little bit on sports, you know, like they don't support a football team in England. Most of my friends, for example, which is it's kind of strange if you're a normal British bloke. Uh, they may not have ever watched a rugby match or American football match, you know. And it's, I think that's sad because it feels to me there's a lot we can learn both in both directions. You know, you've got... Um, uh, you know, professional basketball players learning to meditate and what have you. You know, it's definitely got in that direction, but I think it can also go in the other direction. I'm, I've been when I've talked to some Australian friends who are really big on sports science. It just seems like there's a lot there, and it's there's a rigorous study of coaching and various things that's going to just going to help so many people listening to this. 
Yeah, no, for, for sure. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest there. You said it, it's, it's two ways. And for me, there is probably far more that call it sports scientists and professional strength coaches. There's far more that we could access if we went to kind of the alternative, let's say movement community. And the reason I say that is a lot of the stuff, you know, in, in your own book and in the embodiment world and everywhere that, that is spoken about isn't part and parcel to your anatomy textbook and your strength, you mm-hmm. know, strength conditioning textbook. You're not even going to find it in a fringe chapter in the book. It just doesn't exist. However, there is such a parallel with what we are trying to do. You know, ultimately we are trying to take the mind and the body and whether it's in an artistic form, which you could argue all movement is, or in a maximization of performance, which is most certainly what pro sport is. It's how do we get this whole thing to interact? And thus there's there's the parallel there. And if anything, I believe that the mind and how the mind and the body marry up, that's something that's being lost Mm-hmm. in in sports science right now it's not fully lost but people are recognizing that we we are going back to just literally paint by numbers inadvertently where it's about the technology and it's about the gps and everything and we can't lose sight of the person inside of the professional as we say and so for that i think looking to to your community is something important which is why i am Great. And this is a real mutual opportunity, isn't there? And this is why Rafe and I got in contact originally. We saw sort of places we could both learn from each other. And the movement culture world is sometimes between those two worlds, the very objective scientific and the more subjective, personal, emotional, spiritual side. And it seems like movement culture is bridging that gap, you know, in terms of the interests of a lot of the the people like Rafe students are really interested in trauma work. And I was telling them about that. And, you know, he was very open to my stuff when when he came along. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. People may not be aware of the rigor in the, it is big business. And what I love, I love about sports science is that people have looked at it scientifically, but also it's competitive. Yes. You know, like there's like, if you were in competitive sports in the U S the UK or anywhere in Germany, anywhere in the world, really this people really want to perform. And in, you know, you can be in a yoga class and spout some bullshit, but ultimately your team are going to be like, can you throw the ball farther? Can you run faster? Did we win on Saturday? Like that emphasis on results, I think just cuts through a lot of bullshit. It, it does. It does. But what it also does is it presents a, an invisible wall mm-hmm. in and around accessing that that cannot be defended empirically. Right, right. That creates huge issues. Because yes. so much of sport cannot be summated into some research article uh-huh. and some uh-huh. empirical finding and go no farther than to, you know, to, to ask an athlete. You know, I did a lot in baseball. I still do a lot in baseball. And just you know, if we look at baseball or cricket, whatever your sport is, I mean, you have half a second to connect this skinny piece of wood <laughs> onto this ball moving over 100 miles per hour. And you have to make the decision to swing and make contact in, by all accounts, at a pre-level of, of, of consciousness, at a pre-level of working memory updating. And if you talk to them and you ask them to describe their swing and what it takes, they're not using empirical words. They're not talking, right. the good ones at least. <laughs> they're not sitting here saying, well, at this moment, my glenohumeral joint rotates. No, they're <laughs> giving you words of, of somatics, of feeling, of flow. Yeah. Of, of yeah. Almost they're, they're trying to describe the ineffable. And so this is why I say there's so much that the professional sport community can learn, but also needs to be reminded by, let's call it the alternative movement community or the movement culture, you know, kind of in the middle, as you described. You know, I was, I'd always watch the British football team uh, fuck it up in the World Cup. And I'd always wonder how they would do it. And pretty much I started to see, I watched it as a child, you know, I was quite emotionally invested in it as a child, watching my dad and my sister. And um, it started to seem like pretty much every time they messed it up was emotional. Yes. They would miss penalties, you know, under pressure. Uh, a football player, Gascon or something, would kick someone because he'd get angry. And then we'd be down to 10 men. And in football, that's just, it's pretty difficult to come back from losing a man to a red card, you know? And I'd see these things, I'd be going, hang on a minute, because I was, I was starting to get interested in psychology at quite a young age. And I'd go, they're losing games on emotions. 
yet all the training I see on the TV seems to be about dribbling and kicking, going between cones. And, you know, they're doing that training while smiling and laughing. And then it's like, that's not the same environment emotionally as a World yeah. Cup. Yeah. And, I, and even at a young age, I went, hang on a minute, what, they seem to be missing the emotional part, which seems to be the part that's really making the difference in terms of them winning or not. So right. any comment on the sort of emotional side of, of sports? You know, that seems like something I've heard you talk about in other interviews. Like yeah, that. no, I mean, so, so what you're... If we, if we step back for a second, when we talk about learning movement, and I believe this is universal to learning movement, and then I'll get to the emotional side. There, there's really these, these, these two things that are interacting simultaneously, right? There's this environment and this body. And, and the words that I will use, and I don't know if they'll resonate with people, so let me explain it briefly, is this idea of there's this, this top-down part of learning where I'm a thinking being I'm a being that thinks, and thus I can make a decision to move in a given way by how I focus. You know, in, in your book, uh, Mark, you have a section on uh, verbal mistakes to avoid when teaching embodiment. This, by its very nature, lends itself. We know that our words influence how people think, and thus that influences how they shape movement. Uh, but equally, there's an environment shaping how I move. If someone is running at me uh, by the very nature of their presence, not due to any thought of my own, I will move around them if I'm a rugby player with a ball in my hand. And so we have this bottom up and this top down. And so to your point, what we talk about when we're, when we're developing practice, it's this idea of, you know, high fidelity or is it representative of this thing I actually have to do on Saturday or, or Sunday? And the, the representation oftentimes get summarized, Mark, to the skill. Ah, oh, well, we have to kick and we have to pass. But right, to your point, right, right. to your point that the, the perception, what I'm experiencing and its impact on my ability to do those things is affected by far more than just the physical task itself. And so yep. trying to bring in competition, which triggers these emotional responses, for some, it shifts them in a positive direction. And it supports performance. For other people, their emotions bury them because they're misapplied in a given context, let's say. And so to your point, being able to bring it all together, it's difficult because you can't take a, a World Cup match and mimic it in training. You know but what I, I do? I'd a lot I, closer. I'm going to jump in some of those negatives. The Irish in me, I like to interrupt. So I'd fill them full of coffee and then put a, a personal stereo on, which had loud shouting in German. That's yeah. what I do. To the football players, you know, I'd get them, get them pumped up, getting ready for do that. <laughs> you know, like because it's state dependent, right? On. <laughs> okay, and this idea that the for me this is about life transfer as well. So you know, why is this relevant to the yoga people listening? Well, a yoga studio is pretty fucking different than life with your kids screaming and your boss having a go. Your yoga studio is pretty different. So it's like, are you learning the skills in a way that will transfer? You know, for you it might be the practice pitch versus the um, uh, the stadium, whereas for most people it's the same principle, but the yoga studio versus uh, being out in the world. A hundred percent. And, you know, my, this is where, and I'd like your opinion on this, Mark, you, what, what triggered in my mind when you talked about your observation of, of the English football clubs, you know, or the national team, and seeing them lose not because of anything necessarily physical, but rather something emotional. How much of this do you think comes down to our separation of mind and body? That, that people like yourself, and I'd like to think me, we're, we're trying to, to glue them, re-embed them back together, but we oftentimes do treat the body as the, as the sole entity, and we, we forget that there's something going on behind the screen all the time, judging, emotionally labeling, guiding, right? It's this mixture that we call one's perceptual headspace. How much of what we see of this choking under pressure mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. not performing, not due to physical limitation, but due to mental limitation, and equally not seeing transference from our given practice to our life? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. much of it is it possibly in this disembodying of, of mind and body, because I have something to say about how my work is yeah. attempting to bring those two back into harmony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear that. And it's, you know, for me, sports is always going to be expression of the dominant culture, 
right? And you see this even with the different sports, like, you know, the, the sports that are popular in America versus in other countries, expression of the culture of the United States. But generally, globally, this disembodiment, this body-mind split is pretty big, and that's going to be expressed in the sport. But where I see a great hope in sport, and I've always thought of sport very positively. Look, I love that, you know, football uh, really did a lot to stop racism in the UK, for example. You know, when John Barnes started playing for Liverpool when I was a kid, he was the first black player. I, I love the positive potential of sport. And I, I see the potential of sport is that the mind and the emotions don't go away and their impact doesn't go away, even if you're not focusing on them. Bingo. And, and sports, people want to win. So they want to focus if they're more holistic in the wider sense of what that means, you know, they're including more of reality. Then the more the more of reality they include and take account of, the more successful they are likely to be. So that's where I think sports could be a lead edge here. And I really see an openness to that. And um, you know, there's always been talk about like motivation, character development through sports. And I, I feel sort of relatively hopeful that, that that sort of martial arts ethos that got lost from Western sports when they were, you know, all the American sports basically are ruined versions of British sports, right? So it's like they were, they were originally character development tools for public schools. That's what they were, you know, pretty much all of them. And, and that character development element got lost. And, and I think we can refine it through things like martial arts or parkour, you know, Western martial arts in a way. Um, and that excites me. Well, I, I think what's what's interesting, I don't know if you've read this one, uh, Zen and the Art of Archery. Yes, yes, a German guy, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, just, just reviewing that, and you, you take books like The Inner Game of Tennis. I mean, the, these books are, are ancient compared to conventional sports psychology and sports science. And in all of them, they almost exclusively talk about accessing technique through how the, the, how the character of the mind influences it. And that's where I think, to your point, the big opportunity lies. And, you know, with, with my work, I'm chiefly interested in how a coach's words or an instructor's words, a parent's words, it does not matter, pick the synonym you like, but how someone trying to teach, how their words ultimately manifest, if listened to deeply, in the learner's thoughts and how those thoughts ultimately shape and influence the way the body moves. And I make a point with my athletes to say, listen, we are going to work as deeply in shaping how you approach this drill as you are actually in executing it. And for me, it comes down to a fundamental emphasis of what versus how. I think, and I don't know if this is the same in kind of your circles, Mark, but in sport, we're very heavy on the what side, the, the concrete. I can describe a program. I can describe a drill. I can break down the biomechanics of a movement. But just because I can break down the biomechanics of a movement to an athlete does not mean that they can take that and perform that with the same level of efficiency as my words. And so know what is different than know how. And, yes, ul yes. and ultimately for me, language is one of the most important ways we shape the mind to help the person learn how to bring this to life. And I think it's a fundamental challenge in movement in general, but it's, a, it's, a well, it's an underrepresented area in pro sports specifically, which is why I focused my attention on it. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, this is the main thing I want to ask you about, Reese. I think it's going to be so helpful for people. Life, you know, words that work, basically, right? Things that do the job. And I, I you know, this was always a bugbear for me. I'd be in a yoga class and someone would say, extend your heart chakra. I'm like, well, what the, what the hell do you mean, man? Like, what are you talking about? You know, the alternative world's bad at this. And then, but the other way people go, either really abstract, so you don't know what they mean. Yeah. Or they're giving metaphors, and you're like, but what, what do you mean by that? I don't get it. And then other way people go is they talk anatomy. But one yeah. of the things, you know, I knew intuitively, and then Rafe confirmed this to me, which I think maybe from your work, was that in t telling people anatomical instructions ain't that great. Like, because we don't think in terms of contract my gluteus maximus, extend my lumbar, lumbar module and whatever. That's just not how people think, right? It's not smart. Yoga teachers do that a lot, almost like a status claiming, like, hey, I know what things are called, yep. right? It's like, well done. You know what things are called? Great. You did your anatomy coloring book. But does it help? Okay. So this goes right back to 
the knowledge of what and the knowledge of how. So Mark, I come, you know, you Aikido, right? That was one of your, that was one of your first disciplines. Okay. And so I come to you for instruction. I know nothing about Aikido. There's, a, there's probably infinite ways any instructor could approach this, but let me present one possible way that takes all the different methods of instruction you just discussed and, and puts them in, in a place respective to one another. And so if I'm working with you for the first time before, and let's say I'm a hypercritical person, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm judgmental. I've had other Aikido coaches. They haven't worked for me. And now I'm coming to you. The first thing I believe a coach is trying to do is develop rapport. Yes, show that right. there's psychological yes. safety, show that I, I care, right? So there's, there's this psychological uh, envelope that's around this experience before we even get into learning something. Yeah, and yeah. this is where I believe the, the, the knowledge of what is important. And in my own work, I call this the, the description. So we're about to enter. You're about to teach me a given movement, a given activity. You are going to describe in so many words what's about to happen. And so that might be around what I can expect. That might be around some of the details of the movement. Hey, your front foot needs to be here. Your back foot needs to be there. Now, again, anything taken to extreme is too far. We're not saying you have to break down the entire anatomy of the movement, but giving me some kind of orientation is important because to your, to your earlier point, if I'm too abstract, let your body float like a butterfly, two clouds, be on the same line and make sure it harmony. Like, no, what? And we've all had that experience where you hit them with the airy-fairy abstract and they look at you like your head's on backwards. But, so it's not about extremes here. And so the description is to build trust, to set expectation, and to develop a level of understanding that says, okay, I'm going to listen to this person. So that's what I call the description. And typically, the description might be colored with a demonstration. Yeah. So you have these two Ds that kind of give knowledge. But I'm going to argue that that is the knowledge of what to do. In no way have I necessarily helped you know how to do it. Now, yes. the, the listener might say, well, hold on. If you demonstrate it, can I not mimic? For sure. And so some people will choose to do that. They do a demonstration and say mimic, or they give a light description, a demonstration, and then say mimic. And so I'm not taking anything away from that method. Yep. But let's say, they, let's say they mimic, Mark. I mimic yep. you. And I look absolutely garbage. I'm so far off the yeah, mark. Yeah, I'm yeah. falling off the cliff. You're like, okay. This ain't going to work. And so you need to introduce information because I have an information gap. I have a knowledge gap. And so that information comes in, my, in the, call it the sport vernacular. We talked about this before we started, what I call the cue. And so the cue is shifting from a knowledge of what to now a knowledge of how. Okay, what can I tell them that will help them coordinate this, know how to actually do it to get back on the path? And so a cue for me, I define it as the last phrase or the last thing we say to a person before they move. And this single statement, it's not two, it's not three, it's one focus point. Okay? Right, right, right. One address in the GPS, my friends. You don't go to three different <laughs> locations simultaneously. Yeah, so many yoga teachers. I heard one yoga teacher give 20 different things to focus on in Downwards Dog. It was like, that's too yeah. many. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I can't be at Heathrow at the same time that I'm across. No. And so, so we give them the one cue. And the focus point then is meant to help them organize their movement. And this is where we talk about the use of external cues where I focus on the environment I'm interacting with, mm -hmm. punch here, step there, or the outcome I'm trying to achieve. That's how we think, right? We think, I'm going to throw this spear in that antelope. We Bingo. don't think I'm contracting my biceps and my quadriceps. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's actually how we're designed to work. Now, now, let's use your spear example. Let's say we are throwing spears now, and I say, throw the spear at the target, and they are miles off. Yeah. And I give and again and again, and I'm like, damn, <laughs> I, I know they're off because their arm is in the wrong position. Yeah. But uh, the spear, I'm telling them the outcome. Nick said external cues, <laughs> but that ain't working. Ah. So how do we then 
bring in language that is not egotistical. And what I mean by that is body-oriented language is ego-oriented language. I'm thinking about moving one given part of my body. Uh -huh. And so this is where, and I know you, you, your first line, I, it caught my eye on 126, you know, was around uh, these metaphors and possibly the pitfalls of metaphor. Uh -huh. metaphor. But at the same time, I think, and hopefully you would agree, I'd like your opinion, analogies and metaphors can absolutely unlock movement yeah, sure, in the sure. nuanced of ways. You know, for me, uh, metaphors are to language as dance is to movement. I, I believe it's an artistic form linguistically that gives us far more. It's, it's almost ineffable at times. The, the, the feeling an analogy will give us is far more than the words on the page. And so now let's say, okay, I want you to imagine that there is a, uh, that, that, that there is a cliff you're throwing over or, or, or a hill or a mountain. And what that will now start to do is let's say they're under throwing the spear in their mind's eye, that will start to create a constraint that will start to shape how they create the line of, of, of the throw. And so analogies are simply a way to take an external cue and bring nuance and shape it beyond just saying, hit the target. And so in my, in my own work, I have what are basically external cueing mo you know, modules. How do you create literal language that is dealing with the literal environment yeah, yeah, yeah. and analogies? Yes. Figurative environments of the mind that can be acted out in the real world. But the key thing to put a bow on this is the description and the demonstration. That's the know what. That builds my confidence. That builds my trust. That builds my understanding of my, my belief in you. And then the cue is the know how. It's the singular address, the singular focus point that my body can work together to achieve. Nice, nice, nice. It reminds me of John Vivekis stuff we've had on the show a couple of times about ways of knowing and different types of knowing. And, uh, you know, I think embodiment as a field is a sort of reclaiming of two or three types of knowing that have been excluded traditionally. And sports can't exclude, you know, skill acquisition. No. It can't include this contextual knowing as, as a, a way of being knowing. It's just, it's just too practical. Uh, you just right back to the beginning of what you said there. This is all gold. There's so much we could discuss. Yeah, there's the basic trust, and for me that involves two things. You know, one, the student assesses you as both competent and safe. So yes. warm, loving, caring, but equally you know your shit, you're on top of your shit. Yes. And that's actually an embodied assessment. You know, that's the British Airways voice when you're on the plane. <laughs> so there's, there's an embodied assessment of warmth and power there. You go, okay, this person's worth listening to. Yes. And then secondarily, there may be a competence thing about, okay, you just said something clever. I know enough about that field, you know. Uh, and then within that, we have what I call operational language, which is the instructional, like it needs to be more specific, right? At times, it's like, let's get, what do you mean by grounding? Let's get specific as to how I do this thing called grounding. But then we can also go big picture, which is like, okay, imagine you're a tree and your legs are deep roots into the ground. Yes. And, but what I love about what I've, I've heard from one of your other interviews, which is so simple, and I think I just, if listeners take nothing away, I want them to get this, is look for the outcome of your cue. And if it didn't do the job, change it, right? Did I understand this right? I mean, it's so simple, but super profound. It is, it is, it is. You know, and I, and I think, the first thing is, we, I, I go through this kind of process. As the instructor, you know, it, it is our burden to know what's inside the computer. It is our burden to know the mechanics and the detail, uh, not, not the athletes, not the clients, not the patients. And so I bring that up because I first need to know what to coach before I can consider how to coach. And I, I don't want this to be lost, that for those that actually are yoga instructors or whatever they might be, when they're looking to deploy a cue, we want to be precise. We want to be purposeful, which means you've observed the movement and you are clear in your own head exactly where the error is, where, where the source of blindness is coming from. And then your cue, to your point, Mark, is meant to be outcome-oriented, but in a manner that emphasizes, brightens that blind spot. And so let me give an example. I do a lot with running. So I'm going to use running, hopefully, as just a universal example everyone can relate to. And so when I have athletes who want to run faster, the goal is always the same, right? It's to go over a given distance as fast as possible, or at least faster than the person who's chasing you. 
And when we watch people run, there's use the, I'm going to call it a failure of emphasis. There's a failure to emphasize either pushing back into mm-hmm. the ground, mm-hmm. what we might generally call extension or just push, mm-hmm. or a failure to emphasize driving the leg forward, which we might just call the, the punch or the flexion, whatever word people want to use. So we have the forward part and the backward part. They have to harmonize together. Okay, you know, we we need more than one instrument in an orchestra. We need more than one joint in the body. So they got to harmonize together, but it's a failure of emphasis. And so when I watch the athletes, I tend to find that they're failing in emphasizing. And here's my analogy I use in they're either failing to lift the hammer or they're failing to hit the nail. And that's a really nice, clear way of the flexion is the lifting the hammer Mm -hmm. and the extension Mm -hmm. is the hitting of the nail. And so when I go to come up with a cue, and this is what I mean, it's outcome oriented. Someone who's failing to hit the nail, they're failing to push back and extend. I might use the following example, uh, external cues. I want you to push the ground away. I want you to explode off the ground. Um, I want you to imagine you are having to sprint up a really steep hill Mm-hmm. To, to bring the weight to, if I don't get a push, I'm not going up this thing. Um, I might make it a little bit more visceral. In, in Phoenix, Arizona, where I used to live, I need you to explode off the line like a rattlesnake is about to bite your ankle. Kind of a poet, aren't you? There's a poetry to There it, is. Right? No, There's a poetry to this. Stickiness. There's a storytelling to yeah. this. Yeah. That makes it memorable. So everything I've done there is to, it's hopefully if we backtrack, the person lacks extension, but they got to go straight ahead fast. So how can, I, how can I still be in service of going straight fast, but coloring it in such a way that it emphasizes the push? And so those are those examples. Now, let's say, what if it's a, a failure of emphasis on the punch, on bringing the leg forward? And so this is where it becomes a little bit more difficult, Mark, because when I extend, I physically hit the ground. It is yeah. something that is literally yeah. external to me. But when I bring my leg forward, it's, ju- it's in the ether. It's just in the air. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so you can say things like, hey, I need you to punch the air. But that does, that's too abstract for people, they don't, right. for most at least. And so what do we do? We get into the world of analogy. And, in the, in, and I talk, there's a number of different types of analogies. But one type of analogy is what I call a constraint based analogy. Yes. So what, what you do as an instructor, you say, okay, let me take the full capacity of the human imagination and say, what could I physically, if I, if I, if I could, if it was the matrix, okay, what could I physically put in this environment? Like you're between two force, panes of glass, something like that. Exactly. Yeah. That would yeah. force yeah. my athlete to do what I want. So the, the, the most famous cue I probably use because everyone latches onto it is I will tell an athlete, I want you to imagine there is a pane of glass in front of you. And I want you to shatter, punish each pane of glass as you run. And so what that does is it's still in service of the outcome, but in a manner that emphasizes front side mechanics. And so and a final thing here now, one of the, the, one of the systems I use when you are dealing with, call it, um, free flowing movement that doesn't necessarily have an, a direct, obvious interaction with the environment during the movement. So take, for example, diving. The most critical part of the diving is when I'm in the air. I'm not touching a wall, a ceiling, a ground. And so how do we actually start to orient people in a manner that doesn't cause them to get into that deep paralysis by analysis? And not my idea, but I've, I've expanded and, and brightened it, is this idea of using tape on the body. And so what you can do then is put a piece of tape on the tips of the knees and say, I want you to drive the tape towards the finish. Nice. Or I, if I'm running fast, I want you to drive the tape towards the sky. Now, to most people, like that sounds too simple to work. The way our brain processes the motion of the tape is yeah. different than the way we somatically start to process thinking about the knee or the hip or the ankle. And so you can use by this, by extension, you can use clothing. And so my, my attempt there was to illustrate how we try to fall. We need to know what's wrong. It's critical. 
Once we've identified what's wrong, we have to figure out how to still stay true to the outcome, but then through emphasis of where the blind spot is in the movement. And then to your point, getting back to your original comment, if I give a cue where I'm certain the meaning is correct, Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean the coat of paint on it. It doesn't mean the words are correct, but the meaning behind the words are correct. Uh, I let it ride. It doesn't seem to work. The first thing I'll do is say, Mark, what did that cue mean to you? Or Mark, did you even focus on the cue? So before we abandon it, we do a little fact checking here. But let's say they come back and they misinterpreted it. Mm -hmm. That's I could make an attempt to help them reinterpret it, or I can say, well, here's what we're trying to do. You need to get your leg forward. Wh what do you think, Mark, you can think about that would help you do that? And I try to use a little bit of guided work, guided okay, imagery. Like kind of coaching methodology there. Think, yeah. think, 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 to get them to the external cue or the analogy. And so like everything we do, Mark, it is, it is nuanced. But hopefully in that little riff there, it illustrates how my mind works around these problem solving of the cue. No, it's great. I'm loving it. I think a lot of uh, teachers out there are just repeating things they've heard other teachers say. Things get passed down. Cues become like um, cultural memes that spread. Bingo. Like I've, I've seen some come Hieroglyphics. from... Hieroglyphics. Right. They're, they're just moving from one culture to another. People are passing them on. That's what you're supposed to say at this point in the yoga class or at this point in the Aikido class. And, and, it, and it's not really going, is this working? That piece around looking, I think, is so important. Why don't we just, usually for a kind of little masterclass here, then like main mistakes people make so we've got saying too many things big, right? big one just a huge one do this 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 now i'm just confused being too abstract being too anatomical not checking the result of the cue and actually seeing if it needs adjusting or clarifying yep. therefore that i've already got so far from this are there, are there any other kind of sort of major mistakes you see coaches making well, I, I think it's just it's another way to color it if you're having to say the same cue over and over again one, that should be a sign that you're probably not watching the move. <laughs> it's not working. And two, that's a pretty good sign that it's not working. But it's again, not madness, right? Trying know, to get a different it outcome. Is, it is. We have a joke, um, you know, in, in coaching. If it doesn't work, say it more often and louder. You know, and, and that, but seriously, think about everyone on here is either at a teacher or a coach. Yeah, maybe more yeah. than one, that that was their philosophy. When it wasn't working, it's your fault. So I'm going to say it more often and louder. Oh, yeah. Got it. And you can switch modalities as well, right? Like if I give an instruction verbally and it doesn't work, I can show it. You know, as an embodiment Bingo. teacher, the embodiment I convey is as important as the words I use. So if I say move your knee as opposed to like move your knee, that's a different feeling and emotional tone behind the words that is being conveyed through the kind of empathic resonance. You know, we, we like our trinities. For me, the, the, the trinity here that you're talking about is the words, the tone, and the body language. These are the three things that as a coach, we want them to all mean the same thing to the person. Yes. You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm trying to motivate you, but my posture says, I do not want to be here. My posture betrays my words. And that's what people listen to. Like I do a fun exercise in my courses and my talks where I say, everybody touch your knees and everybody touches their elbows. Because <laughs> if you're listening to this on the podcast, I'm touching my elbows or saying touch your knees. Yeah, and 90% yeah. and, and of people do go with what you do, not what you say. Yeah. So this is where the body's got to be aligned with what you're saying. And, and so this is where... When you asked me to be on, I was, I'm really excited because oftentimes, you know, we, we think of, of language and, and thinking our way to better movement almost as, uh, by extension, possibly disembodying. And, and I thought about that a lot. But for me, when we look at what an external cue is really doing and why it makes sense and we haven't even gotten into the evidence. I mean, there are, there are hundreds upon hundreds of papers on this stuff, let alone just already as we've been riffing here, the intuitive nature of what we're trying to say. Everyone's experienced this, on the, hopefully on the positive end, but most certainly on the negative end. But when we talk about external cues or analogies, everything about that philosophical approach to using language to shape focus, to shape movement, is about re-engaging you with the environment. Because ultimately the information to change the movement is in the environment. All a cue is doing 
I've never said this, but I like this. And tell me if you like it, Mark. All a cue is doing is introducing you to a part of the environment you had not in that moment considered yet. That's what I see it doing. And no. so let me, give, let, let me give an example here. My son learned to ride his bike in the COVID scenario. And I, I have this whole thing around the conditions for learning and that kind of early on a coach's job is to get out of the learner's way create the right conditions for learning and, you know, let, let the environment do the talking and the body do the walking. But inevitably people tend to just stay good enough. We've already talked about this in the Aikido example. You know, you're letting me just have a go at it, but I'm, I'm losing the plot here. And so I identified that my son was, was overturning his handlebars when he would speed up. And that's when he'd speed up, he kept slam into the ground. He could ride his bike if he went slow. But it was mm-hmm. when he tried to get, but that was the problem. And so he it, it was starting to erode his desire, motivation. He didn't want, he wasn't as quick to go grab the bike out of the garage. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to step in and try to help you. And what I recognize, this is what I mean by introduction. The handlebars as, as an object to interact with as a, as a portion of the environment is where the information lived. Had he been aware at some implicit tacit level that the handlebars were where he was going awry, he would have been able to make the change. This is what I mean by introduction. This is what I, what I mean by emphasis. Yes. And so I asked him, I said, we're a musical family. I said, Madden, show me what your handlebars are doing when they're too loud. And he moved them all around. Now, had he not answered the question that way, Mark, I would have abandoned ship. I would have gone a different route. Uh, uh, and he understood the meaning of the question. And then I said, show me what your handlebars are doing when they're quiet. And he, and he grabbed them. He just made this deal. I said, Madden, what do you think your handlebars should do when you speed up to catch your sister? He said, he's four and a half at the time. They need to be quiet. Nice. And I love this is classic coaching, which for life coaches listening is common sense. But for martial arts instructors and yoga teachers, not so much yes. that you didn't just tell him, move your handlebars quietly. Even after establishing that metaphor, you let him work it out because then there's ownership and there's, exactly. there's, there's, he's made those links himself. And so what that now did for me is it was, an, it, it was introducing him to a portion of the environment, a portion of the bike that had, the, the handlebars were his teacher, Mark. That's how I, I, I see it. The environment always is the teacher for me, but it's a matter of, I think my cues more than anything are helping you learn how to interact with that environment, with that teacher. That's why I use the word introduction. And so as I reflect on how I use language in general, that's what I'm trying to do. It's a failure of emphasis, and we use language that serves the outcome, but brightens the area where the information, the handlebars, is needed to progress. You know, a lot of this, I heard you talk about attention in another talk, comes down to attention, right? It is. This is attention, absolutely. One way I'll adjust yoga students is I just click for example, and they'll go, oh, and their attention will go out, and I'll be like that, right? So it's just, just the movement of attention is, a, you know, this is a big thing in a lot of uh, arts, like Aikido and things like this. It just strikes me that where the attention is and how the attention is used is, is a key piece here, and the emotional sense that goes with that could be the key thing as well, right? But there's, uh, it's way more than just the instructions of mechanics. No, 100%. I mean, we're, we're, we're throwing... Whether we say focus, attention, intention, these are all synonyms that we are using to talk about from an experiential perspective, the same thing. And, you know, from an instructional perspective, this attention operates like a spotlight. And, and you, you know, Verveke, John Verveke and I have talked about this. The mechanics behind attention cannot be summarized as simply as it's a spotlight. But in terms of my lived experience, pragmatically, my attention feels like a spotlight. And so for those listening right now, if I was to say, can you do a quick body scan? If you're sitting down, how do your hips feel on the chair? How do your feet feel on the ground or in your shoes? If you have a watch on your right hand or left hand, how does that feel? Arguably, assuming Mark and I are not that boring to listen to, you were unaware of those sensory experiences, yet they were available to you all the time. And so at any given moment, there is far more available than you can focus on. And thus, as coaches, we need to be keenly observing how our learner is paying attention. And when we pay attention the right way, 
we access information that we store that expresses itself as renewed ability. We call that learning. But when I'm not accessing information in the right areas, i.e. I'm not paying attention to the right things, that's where we can either use the environment to physically grab focus yes. or we can take more of a top-down approach, which is language. But everything at play here is attention, which is why I talk about attention being the currency of learning. And I right. believe that. you can't just be around something. Otherwise, you, you've probably been on a lot of flights. I ask this question in every presentation. I find the one person in the room that's been on over 800 flights. And I say, okay, stand up, 800 repetitions. Go ahead and give me the safety briefing verbatim. <laughs> Can't no, do it. Can't do it. No but think about, come up with a million examples like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because you are around something yes. doesn't mean you learn from it. No, because you're there wasn't meaningful. I think this is where you know uh, Peterson, John Vavake, talk about meaning a lot, which I think is really important for learning. And how do we make things meaningful? I think if you're looking at attention and remember, you know, the awareness arts embodiment by definitions about awareness. Yes. So, that, so those like, you know, people like Viveki who are meditators, they have a more sophisticated sense of what it is than the average sports scientist, just because it's their main currency. You know, if you're a meditator or a yoga teacher, I think of awareness as having a shape. So when I'm looking at a student, I'm like, what's the shape of their awareness around them? Is it a cone? Is it narrow? Also, I consider it as having a quality. Is it laser-like? Is it fuzzy, for example? And, and by working with the shape and the quality of the awareness, that is really changing a lot. So, uh, but the first thing is like, does this even matter to someone, right? Like talking about attention, there's two things that really means. One is the shape of awareness. The other thing is, are they paying attention? Like, is it meaningful to them? So how, because that helps people remember things, right? Like I've heard you give the analogy before of who remembers their child's birth? Most people, yeah. right? But it's like, you know, who remembers the safety briefing? Not many. So how do we make things meaningful to people? Okay, so there's, 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 a, there's, a, lot, there's a lot in there. That, and one thing I want to put a footnote on is this idea that if, if you've been listening to us talk, sometimes people think that body awareness buds up against this idea of external cueing. Like, okay, hold on. When I move, I think externally, but what about body awareness? Should I think about my body to move better? L let's put a footnote on that because I want to come, hopefully you do as well, mm -hmm. come back to that. Mm -hmm. But I want to yep. talk about the meaning first. Um, and so not every cue can, can be this, this poetic moment of, of insight. Okay, let's just be honest. But I actually think great coaches are instructors are great storytellers and they know how to take the mundane and make it meaningful. And I think a lot of this comes down in, into their communication habits, into their, their, their linguistic skills. And so I want to tell a short story on how I, how I, well, I should say I observed myself doing this and I only later understood what I did. And so I had a personal training client. And this is when I had just started as a personal trainer. And we sit down and we go through the whole breakdown of his goals and everything. And so I say, well, you know, what are you trying to achieve? And he says, we got to understand, I'm separated from my wife. We have a five-year-old son. He lives with mom. And he's the most important thing to me. And as a, as a 20-year-old, <laughs> that was pretty heavy. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm nodding, smiling, but I couldn't necessarily relate to it which I, I, I know that because I've only recently started telling this story since I've had kids. Mm. And he says to me, Nick, he, he, my son has a poster of Superman on his wall. Superman is the most important thing to my son. And I need to do, I want to do everything I can to be my son, Superman. And you could hear there was, there was pain in this comment, but out of that pain, there was opportunity. And so we're a couple sessions in and we're doing the mundane. We're doing the single leg RDL. And like anyone doing the single leg RDL, you know, balancing with two dumbbells, his body's all over the place. He's not head to heel, stiff as a board. He's not hinging well, so on and so forth. And so I've thrown every cue at this guy. Nothing's working. And so we come into the last set. I say, and I, I remember the Superman. I'm thinking, oh, Superman off building Lois Lane, long flat body position, RDL bottom position. Beautiful. Okay. I want you to, as you get to the bottom, I need you to get long like Superman reaching out, coming off the building to catch Lois Lane. And he kind of looks at me with, with a, a little bit of a starry eyed gaze and he, and he nails it and he gets up with it and just like, just mm -hmm. watering in his eyes. He just says, thank you. And we move on with the session. No other words were exchanged for that. And so I share that 
because for me, that's what, that's what I try to do in my own practice is ultimately we talked about it firstly through building the rapport, through building the relationship. I get to know Mark. I get to know who he is, what he's about, likes and dislikes. And it's not like I'm giving you some forced questionnaire where you have to give me all this raw material, but I'm actively listening, knowing inherent to the words and stories you're sharing with me, there is meaning because it came from a source of meaning, which is you. And so often, if we listen, we will find so many anecdotes, words, phrases, yes. experiences, yes. we can then repurpose yes. in a manner to something that we are trying to generate meaning. And so in connecting with this client, I connected to him through him using his own source, his own narrative, which further connected him back to himself in learning this movement pattern. And so for me, that's how deep, that's how deep this goes. And that's how serious, not in a serious way, but how important I feel getting our language right. Because, you know, language for me is how I connect my meaning, my thoughts to you, at least in a very rapid way. And so that's just a way to illustrate how this can help bring meaning to what we do. Nick, that's great. Thank you. We're almost out of time here, which is a yeah. shame. It's really flown by. You put a little bookmark in something, which was the um, do extern does external cueing uh, contradict body awareness? Yes. Well, let, you, you know enough about both. I'd like to ask you what you think, firstly. No, I, I want to put this one back to you. I want to hear you, you on this. So for me, uh, awareness is one of the most important words for me. Awareness, by its definition, presupposes that I am aware of something. Something has occurred. There needs to be something there, literally or figuratively, for me to place my attention on, thus to be aware of. And so I use awareness cueing all the time. If you were with me, I might say, I want you to tell me how that felt. If they don't have the vocabulary yet, I might say, did you feel tall, short, rotated, long, heavy, light? And we start to create a vocabulary of self-awareness that usually is used Sometimes to preempt movement, and I'll use phrases like, I want you to notice while you move, or most certainly after a movement is done. I want to draw the distinction there that that is very different than me telling you, Mark, on your next rep, I want you to focus on flexing your right hip. Or Mark, on your next rep, I want you to focus on keeping your knees straight ahead. In that case, I'm giving you an intention. I'm giving you a goal. I'm not asking you to be aware of the product of a goal. And so for me, external cues and analogies are the operating system of intention. They are the address in the GPS. Right. But for me, awareness absolutely is a part of the picture in how we bring nuance, flow, feeling, and connection. Because ultimately, if I give you two words, push versus punch, do those words, Mark, feel the same to you? No, they're no. different flavor. And you had to access your ability to be aware. You had to simulate yep. those words yep. Yep. in the body. That is very different than me asking you to intend to do something. And so yes. for me, awareness colors after the fact to bring meaning to what my intention is helping me do. And thus, internal language, by default for me, is not synonymous with body awareness. Well, Nick, I love your clarity. I love your passion. This has been a real pleasure. Just a little one you might not be aware of. You know, you've used my name 13 times on this call. And that's, uh, I, that's, I didn't know the number, but I'm was, aware that I'm using it. Yeah. And it was like, that, that for me was like, you were keeping my attention as an interviewer. You've got a great habit of that, if you don't mind me saying, you know, and, and that's a real good coaching skill. It's like, are you listening? You're listening. It's your name. You're like tuning in. Americans do this way more than British or Irish for some reason, actually, with the, with the yes. naming. I, I know on American guests, they always say my name multiple times. British or Irish guests, almost never. So yeah. it seems like you guys have somehow in, got in the culture of trained this, like keeping attention in some way. <laughs> Maybe. Listen, Nick, it's nice to see you're doing a real sport now. And the, I just looked it up. The Irish team are the fourth in the world, apparently. So you're obviously doing a good job there, just after England. So sad, so sad. <laughs> and um, yeah, obviously doing a great job there. It's super, you know, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you on. Uh, where do people find your stuff? People are going to get your book from Amazon. It's uh, The Language of Coaching, right? Yeah, The Language of Coaching, The Art and Science of Teaching Movement. That's on Amazon. 
uh, the language of coaching.com and at Nick Winkleman for uh, me giving my, my stream of consciousness updates beyond the book. Sarah, it was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Mark. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes, um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. This comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Whew, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.